Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Investing with IBD podcast. It's Justin Nielsen here, your host, and joining me, as always, is Arusha Pires. He's an O'Neill Global Advisors Portfolio Manager, and Happy New Year, everyone. Happy New Year, Arusha. How are you? Yeah, thanks, Justin. Happy New Year to you. And it's you now this is becoming a tradition at the beginning of every new year uh, it's, uh, with our featured guest today. I'm, I'm, I'm always excited to have our uh, guest on uh, for today. Well, let's bring him on. It's Jeffrey Hirsch. Uh, you might know him from the Stock Traders Almanac. So again, it's always nice to get his kind of outlook. Uh, and, and, you know, there's so much data, Jeff, that you collect. Uh, it's it's always so neat to see your almanac when it comes out because there's just so many ways to slice and dice things. And it can just give you such a flavor for what's happening in the market, what's happened in the past. So it's always great to have you on, Jeffrey. Thank you so much for joining us again. Great to be with you guys. I like this tradition as well. And Happy New Year. Hope you guys had some fun over the holidays. Did, yeah. You know, I, I know you're dealing with some weather there. I was uh, I was up visiting my sister, and I had to get out of Dodge before Northern California flooded, basically. Oh, yeah. So uh, <laughs> we're, we're seeing rain in California like uh, we haven't seen in for, you know, a very long time. But, After some periods of droughts, too. Yeah, right. All those fires. Yeah. Well, let's get into it. And uh, I, I want to start off with just kind of saying, wow, on some of the calls that you made last year uh, when you were on. Um, you know, we're, we're certainly going to get into some of the indicators that you look at, the Santa Claus rally, the, the first five days, the January barometer, the trifecta, as you call it. Right. Um, and, you know, when we were on <laughs> last time, we didn't have the Janu January barometer, but you were kind of saying, look, it doesn't look like the trifecta is happening this year. And we had uh, midterm elections, uh, second year of a presidency. So I, I feel like there's a lot to cover about your calls from last year. And then we can get into what mm -hmm. your forecast is for this year. So um, where do you want to start? Well, I mean, I think you're starting us off with the, you know, the January indicators. Mm -hmm. You know, we got to make sure that everyone remembers that the Santa Claus rally and the January barometer were invented, discovered by my father, Yale Hirsch, mm -hmm. in 1972. There's some pictures out there on the uh, internet on our social media feed that show that table of contents. And, you know, he also created that phrase, if Santa Claus should fail to call, bears may come to Broaden Wall. Mm -hmm. He's a bit of a songwriter, if you, if you, <laughs> if you did not know that. And um, people have, are mistake, mistake the Santa Claus rally for some year-end rally that's this trade and st trading strategy. But it's really an indicator. Mm -hmm. And it's a specific time frame not this nebulous period from Halloween through, you know, January. It's the last five trading days of the year and the first two trading days of the new year. And that period's up on average about 1.3% since 1950, sort of a period of time when uh, a lot of people go away and get the pros left, picking up bargain stocks that have been oversold for tax loss selling and the like. And when you don't get that rally, it's not a great sign for the year ahead. And we often see, you know, lower prices or bear markets. Um, like we had a 2000, you know, the end of 99 and, and other periods or, you know, or flat years. But what we've seen over the years is, and then there's the January barometer they invented as January goes for the S and P the full month. So goes the year. Mm -hmm. Another thing that, um, folks forget Yale invented. And then there's the first five days indicator or early warning system, as we call it in the almanac, it's been around for a long time. Standing on top of Yale shoulders, we put together this January indicator trifecta. Right. Now, here we are. We just had a positive Santa Claus rally. I don't know if I'm dating this too much, but it's important. Um, second trading day of the year. We don't have the other two indicators in, but when all three are up, you have the market, which it wasn't last year. Which it wasn't, right. When, when, when we turned a little more negative after our our, our – podcast last year when all three are up market is up the S&P is up 28 of 31 years that's like 90 percent of the time and average gain is 17 and a half percent for the year so wow. didn't happen last year we came into the year negative with the um you know midterm election year bias right. we're also up pretty high we knew the fed was going to be tightening Inflation was starting to perk up. We weren't buying the transitory vibe anymore from, from the Fed. Right. And um, then things started to deteriorate. We were looking for, I mean, our forecast headline was early year top, worst six months correction, Q4 rally. 
Mm-hmm. Kind of happened that way. Um, not exactly. NASDAQ and, and Russell and stuff topped in, in, in November 21. And um, we did have the worst six months correction in the bear market. Uh, we did get our prototypical textbook October bottom. People will contend that it's going to get taken out. I would take the other side of that right now. Um, we shall see. We were just talking about, uh, in, in, you know, in the green room there that NASDAQ took out that October low and it closed, but not intraday, which I think is a little bit more constructive than, than mm-hmm. just, just it, both of them being taken out. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we look at the four-year cycle and the seasonals, you know, and you've got a very typical midterm election year bear market that just occurred. Right. We don't see a lot of back-to-back down years. And when we have a midterm bear, you've got, I mean, as it's printed, I don't know if you guys have your almanac yet, as it's printed in, in my outlook, the pre-election years after midterm bear markets are even stronger than regular. Mm-hmm. Admittedly, we have headwinds here, which I don't want to get ahead of myself. Mm-hmm. But, you know, this sets up that sweet spot of the four-year cycle, which is also something we put on a featured page of the 23 Almanac, which, mm-hmm. of course, if you don't have yours handy, I have mine. <laughs> uh, Available on Amazon or yes. wherever you Or are. you can give us a call. Anyway. Com- comes with a subscription to our newsletter. Right. Perfect. Mm-hmm. You know, so you don't have to worry about it. Here's that that sweet spot page we put out there. I don't know if, if that does anything. We can always post those charts up on the mm-hmm. on the post-production. Yeah. But um, – the three quarters from Q4 midterm year to Q2 pre-election year is the strongest part of the four-year cycle. Set up pretty nicely last year. <clears throat> Dow and S&P up about 20% over the three-quarter period on average. NASDAQ mm-hmm. almost 30, about 29. Yep. Um, so we've got that you know, tailwind for us to counteract some of the macro headwinds we have, which may be mm-hmm. dissipating, but you know, when you also see all these bears out there, you get your contrary antenna purring. Right, right. And you put that together with the seasonal patterns and the four-year cycle patterns and some of the underlying technical and fundamental data. And um, it's hard to be as bearish as everyone else for me right now. <laughs> right. Um, so, you know, again, you, you, you had talked about the last time you were on the show uh, that this seasonal you know, expectation of, of an October bottom. What's, what's so special about October? Well, there's, there's several things. And when you look back into the history of the almanacs, which are some of them behind me, mm-hmm. dad wrote about this back in the early days. And aside from a certain, um, you know, deadline that occurs, which I'll get into in a second, you've got October sitting at the beginning of the fourth quarter. Right. Okay? Which, I mean, Arusha, you're a portfolio manager. Right. You do things. You clean house, restructure, right. third quarter, get set for year end, right? So you've yeah, got a it. lot of chalk in your position right. by the institutions. Then you've got the October 31st mutual fund and, and 40 Act fund deadline, which is a little bit of complicated accounting if, if, if you dig into it deeply. But basically, in order to prepare taxes and statements and things for year end, on October 31st, some of them do it on September 30th now, which helps create that September negativity that we know. They they do a a, a reconciliation of uh, the previous year and then the the nine months or the ten months ending ahead of time because you know you have the fiscal and and the you know calendar year and all that accounting and changing of of portfolios around the filings that happen there tend to create this this October phobia that we mm-hmm. see out there, which also has to become a self-fulfilling prophecy. Right. So you got a combination of um, habitual, seasonal, fund manager, collective market, you know, participant behavior, plus a deadline um, from the federal government on filing uh, the, the reconciled accounting for each year. And that creates that, that situation. Mm-hmm. Makes sense. Um, so let's get a little bit more. You, you've, you've been talking about this four-year cycle, and you've kind of touched on it a little bit. Uh, we just went through year two. Um, what? Maybe maybe discuss a little bit that that cycle. What the expectation is? Um, what typically happens? Well, be, before um, we get into that, Justin, maybe like with the, with the sweet spot here. Yeah. 
Uh, because with, with, with the sweet spot you have, and you mentioned with this macro, uh, we, we have all these macro headwinds that hopefully will start, you know, start right. slowing down here. Are, are there any other years that kind of had a similar type of scenario that, that we're in right now where you are in, you're in the sweet spot, but it, it was able to kind of still perform with these kind of macro headwinds? Did, anything I don't know, 62, 74, um, even 08, though we did okay. have a, a takeout, you know, a low there in, mm -hmm. in, in 09, but, mm -hmm. you know, people okay. have looked at, I mean, I, I don't look at 08 as much because it wasn't a bid term year, but 62, 70, uh, mm -hmm. I mean, those years were, I mean, especially 62 where you had Cold War activity going on. Right. Right. 74, you had, you know, oil embargoes and, mm -hmm. and energy situations end yeah. of, the end of not the end of the cold war but the end of vietnam sort of coming you know i think we pulled mm -hmm. out of there april 75 if memory serves <clears throat> so some of those years are similar okay um there are you know colleagues and friends that have that contend otherwise um where they're looking more like we're in a 73 situation ahead of 74 i i, I don't subscribe to that um probably my four-year cycle bias but mm -hmm. Uh, at least I, I, I know I know I have one and I admit it. Right. Um, and you'll act on it if all of a sudden you're, the market's proving you otherwise. And the so. market has set us up for that. I mean, we had the typical midterm year, you know, behavior with that bear market. So um, there's other years out there. I mean, okay. But that's that's a, that's a pretty good uh, uh, area to kind of start looking. Right. Um, so let's let's talk about that next year then, uh, the, the the third year after you get that second year in the cycle um that third year you've, you've already kind of set it up already uh that you typically get some strong bounces um maybe you can kind of touch on though that the headwinds you know you've got a, yeah, I a mean, Fed, inflation recession fears all of those um so you got is, is that something war that be, yeah yeah exactly there's which, a lot to point which to, promises right? to go on for a while mm -hmm. Right. Um, remember my February 24 headline, Cold War 2.0. Mm -hmm. um, and then you've got China and the supply chain stuff, which is looks like it's um, uh, 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 rectifying itself or, or, or working itself out. But now that they've they've uh, removed the restrictions, now they're all getting it. And you can't yeah. tell what's really going on there because they're not, not reporting it properly. But from some of the other reports, it, it does look like they're 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 kind of back where we were in, in 2020 on some level, which is disconcerting for the people and also what might happen to demand and stuff. But um, it looks like they're working, working through that uh, better than the rest of the world did in 2020. So those are the main headwinds. Um, if the Fed should not do what it looks like they're going to do in the dot plot, which is wind down after another, you know, hike or two, another a 50 and a 25 is what it kind of looks like. Okay. If inflation, you, you guys all see the numbers. I mean, uh, we'll talk about my forecast uh, next, but, you know, we do a six-month exponential moving average smoothing of the CPI and the PPI, mm -hmm. and those are rolling over nicely. Um, you know, those are the main headwinds. Uh, you know, there's there's technical ones out there that, that we're looking at. There's some uh, overhang there at, at 3,900 S&P. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. There's a lot of consolidation, uh, you know, a lot of distribution up there. Uh, it would definitely help to break through that. Um, tech and NASDAQ still on the mat, you know, uh, right. basically. There's there's yep. small places of, of, uh, of encouragement, but in general, you know, those were the, that was what was flying um, after after the initial COVID drop. And it's it's, you know, it's the spinning wheel, you know, yep. Yep. must come down. So I think. You know, those are some of the headwinds I see. Okay. Right. And when you get kind of, you know, you, you have all this data. Oh, yeah. Earnings, sure. sure. We're seeing a lot of it's, estimates, it's you know, coming week, down. Next week. Um, but our friends, so. Stan Stovall and the guys, you know, at CFRA have projected, you know, the earnings recession bottoming in Q2. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. Yep. Mm -hmm. But this so, could be, this Q1 could be pretty tough. Right. Uh, Right. Yeah, we Corporate think it's going to be choppy. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. And and to your point, it doesn't necessarily have to undercut. You know, it doesn't have to go lower. But choppy, you know, can be, you know, pretty 
pretty rough going too. Uh, so w with all the headwinds that you just mentioned, but you know, on the plus side, you have kind of history behind you. How do you reconcile those two? You know, when you've got a lot of people saying, oh, well, this time it's different because we have all of these things to deal with. Um, what's, what's kind of your response to that? Well, it's not just history, though. History is where I lean and mm -hmm. seasonal, which is kind of history too. But there's also some other macro tailwinds, um, jobs, GDP, um, you know, the growth not being so bad, uh, earnings not being, you know, horrible. They're, it's coming down a bit, but um, valuations have gotten more attractive. Mm -hmm. um, and some of the technical support. I know we've got some resistance and we got NASDAQ, you know, uh, flirting with those October lows, but the Russell held the June lows. The old the old Dow is, you know, powering <laughs> ahead, you know. That's where it's exactly. at, right? Everybody yeah. wants to forget the Dow exists. Oh, yeah, when you say, what the market do today? What do you say? Oh, it was up 100 points, right Dow on. points, you know, yep. whatever. Yep. So, um, so that's what I say. I mean, we have a, a five-discipline approach. I mean, it's... The other thing I'll get to in a second, seasonals, fundamentals, technicals, monetary, and psychology, sentiment. I mentioned, I think, a little while ago, I mean, the bears out there are pretty heavy. Yeah, there wasn't this big capitulation wipeout, you know, that everyone's expecting it to be exactly this, the V-bottom turn. But, you know, there are other types of bottoms, and there's a lot of bears out there. A lot of people are concerned. You, you get that. I put out anything bullish. I get a lot of, you know. You know, not when the Fed is doing this or not, you know, all that right, kind of right. response from the people out there. Yeah. So, and everyone's everyone's predicting also the, all everyone's assuming that the first half of the year is just going to be terrible. Right. Mm -hmm. You hear it from everyone now. It's like, yeah, the first half is going to be terrible. Second half will be good. Which, yeah, I, I, you know, it kind of makes me nervous when everyone's assuming. I don't that's what's I mean, happen. I think the first quarter is going to be tough. Yeah. Um, January has, you know, weakened. His, you know, seasonally over the years, you can see, we did a we do a 21 year seasonal, you know, typical uh, trading chart for each month, which I put out there. I think it was a couple, yesterday, the day before. And the end of January has been weak the last, you know, 21 years, which is the sort of minimum cycle I'll look at for a pattern. OK, um, it's, it's an odd number. Two decades. <laughs> you get no 50 percent. Right. <laughs> but, um, you know, and that's across all the, the indices that we track. It's Dow, S&P, NAS, and Russell 1 and 2000. So, uh, and they all track the similar pattern. Um, so January can be a rough spot. February is historically the weak link in the best six months. Mm -hmm. And I see, I think towards the end of the Q1, we're going to start, you know, getting some traction. Mm -hmm. Well, let's go ahead and uh, take a break real quick. And when we come back, we'll get into more of the details on your forecast. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Hey, trader. It's the new year. Have you made your trading resolutions? Vantage Point can help you conquer volatility in 2023. Learn to trade with artificial intelligence. Visit www.freestockcoaching.com and discover how to predict market trends one to three days in advance with up to 87.4% proven accuracy. No matter which way the market moves, Vantage Point's patented AI can give you a massive edge. Visit www.freestockcoaching.com and learn how to dominate the stock market in 2023. That's www.freestockcoaching.com. And welcome back to the Investing with IBD podcast. It's Justin Nielsen here, along with my weekly guest, Arusha Pires from O'Neill Global Advisors. He's a portfolio manager over there. And our special guest this week is Jeffrey Hirsch. It's kind of our New Year's tradition to have him on. He's from the Stock Traders Almanac. His father, of course, started that, Yale Hirsch. Uh, wh when was that? Uh, that First started edition that? was the 68. 68. Okay, so he started that in 68, and Jeffrey is continuing the tradition, uh, you know, started by his father, and again, he joins us uh, and, and at, at the first part of the year, which is always great to kind of get his take on the previous year, and what we're going to get into right now is his forecast uh, for the next year. So you've already kind of mentioned a few things. You're expecting a, a little bit of a rough quarter, and what what other elements of your forecast can you share that kind of are based in history and some of the reasoning you have for the, the, the forecast that you're making right now? Well, we touched on a bunch of it, you know, in the beginning. I think last year's action is is a real um, basis for, for, mm -hmm. for this year. I mean, it had, had we been up 
uh, a lot last year, I wouldn't be so bullish this year. Very right. typical mm-hmm. midterm election year bear market, October bottom. I mean, you know, I can't write this stuff. Oh, wait, we did write this stuff. But, uh, <laughs> um, but, you and, know, and you said it too. You said it here. So <laughs> I said it there. We said it a lot of times. Yeah. But, um, you know, it doesn't always work out that way. Sure. Um, it, it happened to be a very typical year. We had some help from exogenous events in, in sure. Europe. Um, supply chain issues and stuff with China, inflation, the Fed. Um, so our, our, our forecast is choppy start, Fed pauses in Q1, and the pre-election year bull emerges. Um, <clears throat> so it's based in history, pre-election year pattern, best year of the four-year cycle. Um, I know the Republican Congress is having a little issue getting uh, started. I, don't, I didn't see what happened today if they were able to elect a, a speaker but um, there's still some positivity for the market. I mean, it, on a market analysis basis, on a, a political alignment issue, Republican Congresses and Democratic presidents are, have been the best combination for market returns with the Dow. If you look at, I think it's on page 10 or so of the Almanac, mm-hmm. up about 16.4% of memory serves. So with a split Congress, it's still, you know, double digit um, situation, but about 11 percent or so uh on average uh <clears throat> that's going back to 49 um so we've got you know a little bit of uh, um uh, uh gridlock uh right. which helps tone down a lot of changes that makes mm-hmm. wall street um a little bit you know uh, nervous about w- what they're gonna have to deal with so that's a positive um the seasonal pattern, we've come up with something called, a, a, we call it aggregate cycle, the almanac aggregate cycle, where we take the seasonal pattern for all years, um, going back either 49 or 46, depending upon we want to get, uh, you know, where we are after World War II, but post-World War II. And then we take the, the year of the four-year cycle, so that would be pre-election years this year, and then the decennial cycle, the third year. And it really traces out quite well. Again, we combine that with, you know, all pre-election years, as well as first term pre-election years for a new president who's really trying to prime the pump to get mm-hmm. reelected, which is what drives it. I think he's going to get some help from the Fed this year by them backing off or at least, you know, uh, laying off the accelerator on, on, on the tightening. And, um, um, you know, then you've got uh, um, after a bear market, a midterm bear market. Uh, you see pre-election years up on average about 20% or so. So we've got a lot of that four-year cycle um, tailwind help for the market. Um, I look at sentiment also. Um, Mm -hmm. Investors' intelligence has been bouncing around down there like it did with the bullish-bearish difference, uh, reminiscent of of 08, 09, and and other Mm -hmm. bear market lows. Um, Just what you hear on the street. Um, all the commentary out there and everyone's like, going to take out the low, you know, uh, or not. The, the, you know, there's no, there's not a lot of whole bullish, you know, expectations out there. There's a few, a, a few analysts that are, that are looking for, for some upside. Um, I don't know if you can use put call anymore. They've messed with that a lot. There's been some right. discussions on some of the, the threads I'm on where, you know, with all of the other weekly options and binary options, it's really right. hard to, to get a proper reading on, on the equity only put call ratio that we used to look at a lot. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, anecdotally, things are pretty bearish. Uh, and then we're looking, we got GDP solid. Okay. Um, we had two quarters down. I'm going to call it a recession. I know they changed the rules during COVID, but um, two negative quarters of GDP is somewhat of a recession. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, you know, consumer confidence has hit a new low. Again, a little contrary there. Uh, inflation rolling over, um, and we've got our, you know, our Dow still leading things. I mean, really holding up the market and, and not not falling apart like the tax. I think there's some support there. And again, with the Russell 2000 holding that that um, June low and not even hitting a new low in October, let alone the you know taking out the October low, it didn't take out the June low. Well, right. and getting getting to that, like you you were talking about uh, the Nasdaq actually making. Yeah, a a new low, and that kind of and maybe we show the chart. Break. Um, yeah, yeah, you guys, you guys perked up on that because yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, I mean, when I'm trading, 
I look at intraday activity, but when you're talking about the, you know, like the index, I'm always the close oriented guy, but the intraday area that you pointed out, I think is, I think is quite important. Right. Um, right, right. The 10,088 uh, mm-hmm. on the NASDAQ, right. Which was the CPI number that, you know, that, that was higher and, and the market gap down. And then by the end of the day, you had that massive surge, which, uh, just from an intraday low continues yeah. to, to hold. On the we market. also had our MACD, uh, seasonal best six months buy signal it came we had those two big days in early october which triggered it which was yeah. kind of like you know kind of a darn you know we 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 were looking for things to go a little bit lower and then they did with the, the cpi print that you mentioned so mm-hmm. you know you can't you can't pick all the bottoms and mm-hmm. all the tops right the, but the if you get top, close you're close yeah yeah. Uh, so maybe you can uh, discuss a little bit since since we're talking about the technical action uh, now um, and, and we'll we'll get to some of the resistance areas that you mentioned, too. But just kind of focusing on the bottoming action, I guess one of the tricks here is that things have been so volatile. You know, you've got, um, you know, I, I mean, just look at that October 13th low after the CPI report. I mean, a big widespread. A lot of this has been headline driven, um, you know, whether it's the the Fed. You know, the, the, the Fed announcement, even though they do exactly what's expected, you know, if Jerome Powell says something a little funny in the in the press conference, you know, yeah. things go haywire. Uh, <laughs> we've definitely seen a lot of uh, big, big movements, you know, between the high and the low uh, on, on the days, especially on those. Yeah, you're seeing the, 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 the market closed like the opposite of the futures, the, pre, the pre-market futures a lot lately. Mm-hmm. Right. Oh, that's interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, there's something I just thought of that I want to jump back to you remember back in august you know early august everyone was all bullish right you know, and right. we had that that summer rally that yeah. summer rally hype that we talk about mm-hmm. in the almanac right. yep. and yep. our our aggregate cycle for for 22 which was midterm second years and seasonals really pinpointed that top and, and it's 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 a uh, an august top now everyone's bearish mm-hmm. not everyone but but a good amount after mm-hmm. we've had that october bottom i would think it's going lower so Again, contrary antenna purring, thinking about that. It's it's just, it, you know, I, I tend to want to go the way that my analysis, my charts, my seasonals are, are going and also against the crowd right? when it comes to these big turns. I mean, you're going to have to stay bullish whenever, when the market's going up. I mean, there's a, there's a time to be contrary and, and there's a time to, to, to go with the flow, mm-hmm. to not fight the tape. Right. Yeah. Um, so maybe talk a little bit about, you know, some of the other resistance areas. So here we here we were. Uh, we had that strong rally in March. Uh, then again, July, August, um, you know, we had the October bottom and it seemed like we were kind of getting a rally, but it was definitely not not straight up. There were a lot of fits and starts back and forth. It kind of seemed like you you couldn't get make much traction. Um, so the indexes were were up. But it it was a lot of back and forth in between there. So I mean, everyone's talking about thirty nine hundred now, four thousand. Mm-hmm. But I'm still looking at that August top as being a resistance level. Okay. What we just mentioned, right. um, we've got to clear that. Um, we got to get through and, and past the two hundred days more, mm-hmm. um, you know, convincingly. Mm-hmm. Um, more than a couple days. Yep. And and you know, with some distance between it, and you know, mm-hmm. not just not cantilevered out there, you know, just waiting to fall back down, but you know, uh, um, a nice, a nice cup and handle, if you will. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's, you know, it, this is kind of like a wall of worries situation for me here. I think we're climbing it. Um, it's going to be, it's going to be a, 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 a battle. Um, yeah. you know, there's still a lot of people that are short. Um, there's still a lot of people that are skeptical, but I'm seeing less and less, you know, bulls out there and you know when everyone's a bear who, who's you know there's a lot of cash on the sideline we right true. back in so you know um, what about like market breadth or are, are you are you taking a look at that and keeping an eye on that it's as... it's been following the market um it would be more constructive and encouraging to, to see some um improvement there yeah. um but it hasn't been as divergent again new highs and new lows there's been improvement we look at that in the pulse of the market feature that we have, which comes right out of the, the, the record keeping section, in the back of the almanac. Um, and um, 
we need more improvement there. Okay. But it, it's not as bad as as as. Uh, there the are bears. some things that are working, right? There, I mean, there, yeah. there, there are some areas that are working for sure. Yeah, there's been a lot of stuff, a lot less new lows. Most of the new lows happen in June, okay. and we've seen you know less and less, um, and that's been an improvement. But uh, it'll be it'll be more encouraging to see a lot more new highs. Mm -hmm. But you're not going to get that down here, you know, at, the, right. at these levels. Right, right. right. So um, we, that'll be confirming when we if we can get the indexes to move. Uh, above August and get, um, you know, advancers outpacing decliners and new highs swelling and new lows diminishing, that'll be more encouraging. Yeah, one of the things we have on MarketSmith, we have uh, uh, NASDQ, uh, which gives daily market indicators. And we, we, we use a 10-day moving average of the new highs and new lows. Uh, you can see that at the bottom. For those of you that are investors.com slash podcast, you can watch the video and uh, you know, you can see that, that that pink line with the new lows has been uh, dominant uh, over the blue line of the yeah. new highs uh, I mean, yeah. for uh, quite a while here. Just looking back at our pulse of the market, week ending, uh, and I, I look at weekly stuff, mm -hmm. old Baron style. You know, back on October 14th, there was 1,245 new lows, 86 new highs. Wow. Mm -hmm. You know, and that number's come down. I mean, when I was in, in a couple hundred each or so thereabouts recently, you know, back at the end of September, it was 52 new highs and 1,575 new lows. So we've seen those go down. I mean, sim similar um, uh, stats on, on, on advanced and decliners, but, uh, you know, you're not going to get a new bull market or new highs when you don't have – yeah, new fifty-two week highs, right, right, in, in, in the individual stock. So, mm -hmm. and I was thinking maybe we also uh, go ahead and you know while we're while we're on charts, maybe pull up the Russell two thousand because you you mentioned how uh, the, the the small caps you know uh, represented by the Russell two thousand here uh, kind of ha held its June lows a little bit better than the other indexes. So, what what kind of information are you taking from the different indexes as different pieces of the puzzle? I mean, I mentioned 74 be before, where it was sort of a scatter bottom. You had the Dow making a low in, uh, or was it S&P and NASDAQ making a low in October? Dow made its low in December. Russell wasn't really a factor back in 74. It didn't really start until 79. But you're seeing a similar situation of, you know, not everything bottoming in sync, yeah. which is, you know, a little different than everyone's used to, but it, it is what it is. I mean, you got that. That you know, two higher lows in the in the Russell, mm -hmm. um, and you also see in the other one sort of that nice you know triple bottom situation with the you know lower low in the mid lowest low in the middle, except for Nasdaq, except on an intraday basis as you mentioned. So mm -hmm. the other thing was that that period of time <clears throat> when the market made that October low is a period when there's seasonal weakness in the small caps versus large caps, Russell. Mm -hmm. You know, fended that off. The 2000 fended that off. So a little bit, you know, supportive, encouraging as well. Um, but it's not going to be easy. This isn't, you know, one of those straight 45 degree angle, you know, right. bull markets. It's it's it's, it's struggling to, to, to gain traction. Yeah. And um, you got to be patient and and stick to your system, stick to your stops. And and, um, you know, just don't be in a rush. Mm hmm. Do you think yeah, there's you know, a chance that it's going to be choppy like that for most of this year? Because th those are some of the things that, that I've heard is like it, it could just be kind of a short, you know, intermediate rallies to the highs and then come back down. and You're just kind of stuck in a range for a while. I think it's going to be tougher in the first quarter. OK. Um, Pre-election year bias there for me and mm -hmm. probably really strong in the fourth quarter. Make it a little more six month sideways action. Yeah. Um, but. You know, you never know what happens with China, Taiwan, North Korea, Iran, true. Israel, true. Lebanon, Ukraine. Who knows? Yeah. You know, yeah. aside from that stuff, we got to get the Fed to to realize that it's, you know, was behind. Now it's ahead to mm -hmm. pause and let and let things take effect. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But that inflation is 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 hurting. I mean, uh, I went out shopping with my wife for, to get stuff. We've got a couple of teenage boys got to stock up on, you know protein bars and all that stuff and and uh 
and geez, like, you know, a bag, a bag of pretzels, you know, was like <laughs> five bucks. It used to be two for five. And we're like, yeah, oh, my God. oh, my God. And the thing that I take away from that, you know, just being a, a dad shopping for, for his kids is, you know, that's that's that inflation. We're just it's, it's still mounting. It may be rolling over CPI and PPI and PCE and all that stuff. But at the cash register and at the supermarket for everybody out there, it's still building. And it's like almost playing catch up because we had inflation spiking in, you know, early last year. But the prices at the, uh, you know, at the checkout uh, counter were not what they are now. So there's a little bit of inflationary catch up hitting everybody in the pocketbook. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, during that, going back to the the, the first quarter of this year, you know, the consumer, the consumer, you know, is projected to to struggle quite a bit. And this is where they are going to pull back because of. All, all the kind of experiences that you just mentioned. Mm-hmm. And then there's the mortgage rates and right. that sort of thing. Exactly. Yeah. A bunch of people. I mean, hey, we got used to low inflation for a very long time. You know, right. ridiculous. And low interest rates. Yeah, yep. absolutely. I mean, 5% Fed funds is not historically high. <laughs> right. right. Yeah. I mean, recent history, yes. But, I mean, it, I mean, my brother, who's 10 years older than me, he tells me he bought a condo back in the 80s. Or like, I mean, he his mortgage, I think it was like 13, 14 percent or something like that. Yeah. Like his first like, you know, after after college, new job kind of condo thing. Yeah. And people are spoiled by not having, you know, having to pay any interest on loans. You know, one other thing I wanted to kind of touch on, because you you talked about this interplay between the small caps and the large caps. Um, any information you can shed on the difference between growth and value, any seasonal factors there? I don't see a whole lot of seasonal factors between growth and value. I think that's a little more rotation oriented, okay. um, more more um, cyclical, if you will. Mm-hmm. I know that word gets tossed around, but we're seeing a shift in the value um, mm-hmm. right here. That's right. why the Dow's doing what it's doing. Yeah. Uh, not as much of a seasonal thing, more of a business cycle and and a um, market cycle type, type maneuver. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, you know what? Speaking of that seasonal factor and some of the sector rotation that's been going on, when we come back, we'll talk a little bit about some of the stocks that are on Jeffrey Hirsch's radar and uh, some of the sectors that might be showing strength. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Hey, trader. It's the new year. Have you made your trading resolutions? Vantage Point can help you conquer volatility in 2023. Learn to trade with artificial intelligence. Visit www.freestockcoaching.com and discover how to predict market trends one to three days in advance with up to 87.4% proven accuracy. No matter which way the market moves, Vantage Point's patented AI can give you a massive edge. Visit www.freestockcoaching.com and learn how to dominate the stock market in 2023. That's www.freestockcoaching.com. And welcome back to the Investing with IBD podcast. It's Justin Nielsen here, along with my good friend, Arusha Paris from O'Neill Global Advisors, a portfolio manager over there, and Jeffrey Hirsch, our special guest this week. And pretty much, I, I think we'll, we'll just make it every year at, in January. Uh, he's from the <laughs> Stock Traders Almanac, started by his father back in the 60s, and he's been continuing that tradition on and showing us kind of the historical seasonality and cyclical place that we're in and where we've been. So let's talk a little bit more about some you know, specifics, dig a little bit deeper. Uh, last year, one of the things that you brought up during our podcast at the beginning of the year was the strength in XLE. Mm-hmm. Uh, a, a good call there because I, I, I'm pretty sure energy did pretty okay last year as, mm-hmm. as you look at uh, the, the end of the year results. Um, what, what's, what's your feeling on XLE now? Is, is, is this move done or is this just part of the, the cycle that it goes through? I mean, it's it's somewhat part of the cycle. Um, we had some impact from the war. Uh, the reason why it came up last year and the reason why it'll come up every year for you this at this time is because it's a seasonal sector trade for us. Right. You've got energy um, commodities and, 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 and stocks making a seasonal low in the sort of December to February time frame. The XLE for us has a historical tendency to bottom in December. Mm-hmm. So we tend to get in there. Um, it's a little bit lower than our newsletter recommendation price. I personally just bought some today uh, mm-hmm. down near the lows. Didn't get the exact low, but I picked some up around 80, 84, 15 or so. Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't see where it closed today. Uh, so it's, what's that? 
84 18. So not much. It was up a bit higher, but we'll see. I actually, it hit our um, target price uh, later in the spring after we had, had spoken and I mm-hmm. eat my own cook and I listened to the, the, the sell price and I got out, went mm-hmm. higher, came back lower, ended up, uh, you know, being a decent trade for me. There were some, there were some that weren't so great. Uh, you know, let's not, let's not be, uh, let's yeah. be honest, you know, it was hey, last year was full of those. <laughs> yeah. It was a tough, <laughs> tough year for traders. Um, and, um, you know, so XLE, you know, I think there's a, a good potential for some, um, you, you know, macro uh, uh, demand with China coming back online and with general demand in the world. But, um, you know, it, it's a seasonal trade for us. Uh, I'm, I'm bullish on it right now. Uh, it's definitely been testing my patience mm-hmm. with um, bouncing around near its lows. Uh, but I think once the bull market gets going, um, that I'm expecting, and we get through this COVID outbreak in China, and um, things begin to settle back down again. I think demand for energy is going to continue to pick up. It's a little bit of a glut with the gas situation I was hearing about in um, in Europe. They bought a lot of LNG, and I think they had a bit too much of it. Um, it's definitely interesting with what's going on with the sort of black market or, or whatever you want to call it with, you know, basically China, I mean, Russia selling oil uh, to, to, to China and India and then, then selling it to Europe. I mean, it's, it's, it's almost silly, but right. you know, that's, that's where, where it happens. And, and, you know, um, the world, the world's not, I, I mean, I'm all for clean energy and the environment. I'm, I'm outdoors guy, but I don't think we're going to be able to go totally green just yet. Um, mm-hmm. A lot of people are not happy with with uh, Mr. Uh, Tesla over there. You know, a lot of people that are green and environmentally conscious don't like how he um, is is politically aligned. Um, I think those cars are a bit expensive. And, you know, you got Ford and GM and all the big automakers breathing down his throat with um, coming out with you. I mean, there's a there's a fully electric Ford F-150, right? Right. Yeah, that's right. which looks pretty snazzy. So, it does look nice, yeah. um, but I think the hydrocarbon demand is going to remain solid for for several years to come. Um, and thankfully, we've got cleaner burning, um, you know, machines and, and equipment. But uh, you know, there's still a lot of people out there needing to get places and, and run things and. The best way to get that energy is still, I mean, even, even the crypto people using a lot of energy to mine their stuff, right. they're not just doing it through solar and wind everywhere. I mean, yeah. Do you, do you have a uh, target price for, for XLE? Our target price is 121.76. Wow. Mm-hmm. Okay. Which is a certain percentage above the That's average the seasonal move. Okay. Um, mm-hmm. So... No, that's nearly fifty percent. Uh, yeah, here, so. no, it's it's good. Well, yeah. from 90, 91 mm-hmm. and a quarter when we put it out, it wasn't. Quite oh, okay, fun. okay, gotcha. Mm-hmm. Okay, mm-hmm. but yeah, from well, the low it was. Okay. Well, on a related note, uh, you know, you mentioned how you know with with China uh, potentially kind of getting rid of their their zero tolerance policy on on COVID, and you know they're certainly going to struggle for a little bit as those those cases rise but um let's maybe shift our attention over to steel uh you mentioned steel dynamics uh ticker symbol stld uh you know the, a lot of these i guess a lot of the commodities and you know some of these uh, things i mean there's certainly the the idea of the dollar uh you know that's been going lower mm-hmm. and you know we've seen gold come up as a result but uh what's what's your take on steel and specifically steel dynamics we got a n- nice bounce on that today well i mean what we do is a screen, fundamental screen, and okay. I'll, I'll tell everyone that we do use Market Smith as part of our selection process, and it's, uh, you know, a, a, an invaluable tool for us. Um, so we appreciate that, what you guys do there. But we also run it through um, Zach's Research Wizard. We take all the, mm-hmm. whatever, 8,000 stocks, and we did it twice this year. Um uh, once before earnings season and then once after we wanted to get some stocks out there. We had a lot of energy 
um, regional energy and other stuff in the first basket. But Steel Dynamics was one of the ones that came through, um, fundamentally screened, technically selected, uh, triple checked at Market Smith. And, um, you know, we look for companies that are have acceleration of revenue and earnings growth mm-hmm. and um, valuations are, are reasonable with respect to the market. It's a PE of four, so so that that's pretty good. And price to sales <laughs> ratio, as well as you know uh, a history of surprises, and um, we look at relative strength. Mm-hmm. We don't want something that's running away from the market or trailing behind it. We want sort of something sleeping below Wall Street's radar, and we want something that's not so heavily followed um, mm-hmm. by the wirehouses with a lot of analysts. So. I mean, I'd sort of jokingly call it pre-can slim. Mm-hmm. Um, we, we try to get in there ahead of ahead of you guys because yeah. we don't want to compete. And we're looking for stocks that a lot of people aren't looking at. So that came through there um, for a lot of those reasons. And it looked good on the charts. How much of the concern is there for you? I, again, a lot of... A lot of companies have been lowering estimates. You know, I, I think at least the last few earnings seasons, it seemed like they were trying to lower expectations so much so that they could kind of come in, you know, at a decent level uh, to those lowered it's expectations. CFO dance. Right, <laughs> right exactly. Yeah, it is. So Steel Dynamics, um, you know, it looks like it's it's looking at a pretty uh, pretty sharp decline for the earnings estimates in 2023. Is that something that you put into your fundamental analysis or is it kind of like, you know, those estimates can change, of course. Uh, let, let's just go with what's been happening. We're looking more at performance with trailing earnings. I mean, if, mm-hmm. if, if their estimates are coming down because of the economy doing well and they and they hit their numbers, we're mm-hmm. looking at disappointments. So it's not just that their estimates are going down. It's if they miss their estimates mm-hmm. There's an issue for us. Right. The other thing was the price to sales ratio when we picked it was 0. 0.7, 0. 0.7. Wow. Wow. Um, so, you know, we look at, I know everyone's earnings oriented, but the one thing that the CFOs have trouble manipulating is top line sales. Yeah. So mm-hmm. we always look at that. Um, but I'm not so concerned with, I mean, the whole world's earnings estimates are, are, are being lowered. Yeah. So if we're going to be picking a basket of stocks, we're dealing relatively with the same situation. And we're looking at a company that's managed that um, pretty well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, yeah. technically, I mean, Steel Dynamics looks is acting very, very well, right? And and pulling back just below the 10-week moving average here, but finding support on the previous base. Uh, and, and as you mentioned, Jeff, the super strong relative strength here. Mm-hmm. I also like what we compare to the um, the canned um, uh, uh, ratings that you have there. You got Bill O'Neill's ratings and yeah, O'Shaughnessy yeah. as well. I think that's a great feature. Um, you know, I can see how we rate, how our pick rates against a bunch of guys that, yep. that I respect. Um, you got Marty's wise technique up there and yep. Jim O'Shaughnessy, who I'm friendly mm-hmm. with, who's done great work. And of course, Bill O'Neill, your, your founder and, and mm-hmm. all of our mentors at some level. Yeah. Maybe. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He may have picked up something from Yale over the, over the years, but, um, <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sure he was uh, look, looking at some of his stuff. Uh, For sure. So, so um, you know, to kind of round out the discussion on, on stocks here, maybe we could talk about some of the managed care areas. Uh, yeah. UNH has been, United Healthcare uh, has been one of those ha- that has had relative strength simply by not going down, you know, as, as much yeah. uh, as the markets. I mean, it, it, it really, you look at this and it doesn't look like there was a bear market at all. It just has... You know, kind of well, I just mean, had the steady, steady move up, right? Um, they've know, been given a lot of stuff automatically through right. Obamacare or through the, you know, mm-hmm. Affordable Care Act. Um, and you look at what goes on out there in the world, and it's just there's so much um, tractions with, with with the healthcare industry. This is a stock that you know this is not normally one of the kinds of stocks we pick because it's so big and everyone follows it. But it's been one that's that's come through our screens that we've picked before and have been in and out of. And it, it's just a, a, a real solid company in that industry. And, mm-hmm. you know, while I love biotech for the future, this this company, this sector is, you know, I mean, how hard is it to get a doctor's appointment for a lot of people out there? It's right. just a, a saturated business. That it's it's um, I don't want to say monopoly because there's a lot of companies in there, but. 
healthcare has just become such a uh, a sticky business, and it's, yeah. it's it's hard to to not be in it. And this is a solid um, solid entry, solid selection. And um, I mean, a P is a bit rich, right? What does it say now on your uh, point twenty four? Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, but compared to the rest of the industry, the rest of the sector, not so bad. Price mm-hmm. to sales, I still got one point six from when we picked it. Mm-hmm. So you know, it's it's um combination of of a fundamentally strong business looking technically sound as as you guys are showing there and um just one of the the solid leading companies in that in that sector yeah Yeah. and 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 to your point it's you know one of those things where okay sure you got inflationary pressures but are you are you going to skimp on your health care uh that's that's, as you said it's one of those areas that tends to be sticky and even if you you know have issues covering that stuff People just go to the hospital mm-hmm. and they get taken care of. And I don't know how many of those off the, offhand that, you know, United Health owns, but they're definitely benefiting from the fact that if people don't aren't, aren't need to skimp on their health care, they just show up and they get taken care of uh, by the government. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, uh, Jeffrey Hirsch, uh, a pleasure again to have you on the show. Uh, really, really looking forward to the next time uh, next year when we can have you on again. Maybe, maybe we have have you on for a mid cycle, uh, right. mid year uh, you know, recap. In, yeah, early summer. Spring. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we we might have to do that to kind of get uh, get get a little bit more of your insight and uh, historical analysis, especially since we are. Uh, in potentially that third year, that that pre-election year. So uh, thanks so much for coming on the show again and sharing your insight. Always a pleasure with you guys. Thanks so much. Okay. And on the show next week, uh, it's going to be Arush and I. We're going to kind of have a little bit of we time and uh, digest what's gone on this past year and uh, start doing some analysis for how we might be approaching the year to come. So thanks for watching us this week, and we will see you next time. Thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe, rate, and review our podcast if you haven't already. We'd really appreciate it. You can also send us your questions and comments to investingpodcast at investors.com. We would love to hear from you and may use your comments on an upcoming episode. Hey, everyone. Thanks so much for watching Investors Business Daily on YouTube. If you want to watch more videos, make sure you hit that subscribe button so you don't miss a thing.